So he is a PhD student there working on rail rail optimization problems. And uh, today he will speak about train timetable rescheduling. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about using Skip as a branch and price framework to solve the train timetable rescheduling problem. And uh, you'll see a list of the people who have been uh, involved uh, in this project at the bottom, some of whom you may recognize. Um, and it's been a collaboration with Network Rail as well, who own and operate the railway infrastructure in Great Britain. So that's good. So, um, so the motivation for studying this problem uh, is basically uh, poor performance uh, in terms of passenger railway services. And I think I probably don't have to persuade most of you of the negative uh, impacts of uh, delays to trains. I'm sure you've experienced it yourself. Uh, but one thing you may not realize is that uh, around 64% of delay minutes, uh, total delay minutes uh, in Great Britain last year were due to reactionary delays. And these are delays which are caused by the knock-on effect of prior delays. So when one delay happens, it, it causes other trains to become delayed. Now, the good news is that the impact of reactionary delays can be reduced by calculating new schedules for trains, which is referred to as rescheduling, in real time that are different from those originally planned. So when an in initial delay happens by rescheduling, you can hopefully minimize the reactionary delay. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve, the train timetable rescheduling problem. Following a timetable disturbance, find a new route and set of timings for each controlled train, such that the new schedule can be implemented in practice under the signaling system and network rails utility is maximized. So but when I say a controlled train, I mean any train that is scheduled to pass through a defined uh, area of track uh, during a time horizon, which is typically one hour. And we're really focusing on large complex station areas. So not uh, large parts of the railway network, but um, bottlenecks on it. So this problem has been pretty well studied and there are a lot of really good uh, contributions in the literature uh, already, uh, but I just want to highlight um, four of the contributions uh, uh, of our research that I'd, I'd like to highlight in this, this talk. So we're proposing a new model for the TTRP, um, which carries out the rerouting and the retiming simultaneously, which isn't necessarily um, true of, of every model in the literature. Um, and in particular, um, the model has a novel representation of the track capacity constraints, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, we've also created a new set of real instances uh, for the problem and uh, tested our method and uh, we found that we could solve 81% of those instances to optimality in 20 seconds uh, and get uh, very small gaps uh, in the remainder of the instances using our tailored branch and price algorithm with acceleration strategies. And the branch and price algorithm is of course where Skip is going to come in and that'll be the second half of the talk. So I'm sure that many people have seen time-space graphs before. Um, so uh, our model is based on a time-space graph. Uh, and in this graph, a path from the source to the sink represents uh, a schedule for an individual train. And so you can see along the horizontal axis, we've divided the time horizon up into a set of discrete time intervals, which are 15 seconds. Uh -huh. And along the vertical axis, you can see that the track has been divided into routes. Um, and so for example, if A and B are signals, AB is the length of track uh, that a train must cross in order to get from signal A to signal B. Um, and th there are a lot of uh, other details that, that went into the modeling of this time-space graph, uh, but I don't want to uh, mention them all now because it would be nice to get onto the uh, the solution methods as well. So I'll highlight um, 
the track capacity constraint because I think that's the most interesting part. So you can see, for example, that both of these trains use route A, B, and they both use route E, F. And so you could have a scenario if one is delayed where there is competition over these nodes, which are called time space resources. And the track capacity constraints um, represent the constraints imposed by the signaling system. So if you look at the uh, image in the middle, you can see three routes, R1, R2, and R3. And the track can be further divided into track circuits, which are these uh, small bits numbered one to eight. So for example, <clears throat> to traverse uh, route three, you would traverse five, six, and then seven, and then eight uh, in that order. So we define these two kind of modes of consuming um, a capacity uh, resource. So there's occupying and banning. And um, you have to understand a little bit about the way signaling works. So in order to um, traverse R3, a train first has to lock all of those track circuits in an interlocking system. So that means it will reserve them so that no other trains can use them. As it then moves along and gets in say from five into six in a sectional release interlocking system, track circuit five will then be released. And then when it gets into seven, then number six will be released. So a train occupies um, a time space resource RT if route R has been locked for train K to traverse and any part of it is still locked during time interval T. Banning is slightly different. So banning is related to the fact that routes share track circuits. So a train, R pri a train bans R prime T, where you can think of R prime as being, say, R2. If it makes route R prime unavailable during time interval T as a result of occupying RT, where R is a route with track circuits in common with R. So for example, our train traversing route R3 when it is in track circuit five, it's stopping another train from traversing R2, but as soon as it gets into track circuit seven, five and six can be released, and it might be possible for another train to then come and traverse route R2. So uh, in many models, just consider occupying as a most mode of capacity consumption, but we've introduced this, um, this uh, distinction between occupying and banning. Uh, what do we do with these? We create these sets A and A bar for each node in the time space graph, such that a time space, uh, uh, a source sync path in the time space graph contains an edge in A if and only if it occupies RT, and in A bar if and only if it bans RT. Now, the definition of these um, sets is quite uh, complex, but there is a kind of visual representation there with the, uh, the red edges being in ART and uh, the blue edges being in A bar for a, for a small example. And uh, you can see here that, for example, um, R is uh, occupied for a greater number of time intervals than um, R prime is banned for. And that's related to this uh, sectional release uh, interlocking. So the idea is that we can um, represent these fairly complicated track capacity constraints uh, accurately, but we don't actually have to model the track circuits explicitly. So we don't have to have a variable, for, for example, for each track circuit. The vertical axis is still roots, but the track capacity is modeled uh, accurately. So here is um, the MIP formulation that you've all been waiting for. Uh, you can see first off that it's pretty simple. Uh, which is deliberate because uh, we wanted to, it to be easy to design effective decomposition uh, methods for it. And it's a path-based formulation. So lambda kp is going to be one if and only if path p for train k is selected. So there could be very, very many possible uh, paths from source to sink in the time space graph. The objective uh, is to minimize the total weight of all the paths. And again, um, we put a lot of effort into to modeling that, but I'm not going to talk about it now. This constraint simply says that what exactly one path must be selected for each train. 
And this is the trap capacity constraint. So this is where the interest is going on. There's one for each node in the time space graph. And uh, this uh, delta is a small positive real number, say, for example, 0.1. You will also see A and A bar appearing in this constraint. And uh, the effect of this is that all of that stuff inside the bracket will evaluate to 1 if path P for train K occupies resource RT. It will evaluate to delta if path P for train K bans RT, and it will evaluate to zero if neither of them are true. Uh, it will never evaluate to one plus delta because we were careful to uh, design A and A bar such that no path can contain arcs in both of them. And what this means in terms of uh, the capacity constraints with occupying and banning is that uh, no RT can be occupied more than once. Um, no RT can be both banned and occupied. Uh, and, but any uh, node in the time space graph can be banned more than once. And that's why delta is defined to be, to be small. So we define it sufficiently small that that doesn't, uh, in practice, create a constraint. And uh, fortunately, these, uh, well, by design, these correspond to um, the constraints imposed by the signaling system. And if you want to see why it may be banned, uh, something may be banned more than once, just look back at the example. So you could have uh, two trains simultaneously traversing uh, R1 and R3, respectively. Uh, and there may be a time interval in which they both ban the root R2. But that's okay, because these tracks are, are parallel um, and they don't interfere with one another. So now I, that's the modeling very quickly. Um, and I want to move on to talk about uh, the solution algorithm. So the, um, the compact uh, version uh, of this formulation, uh, it's very similar to a multi-commodity uh, well, it is a multi-commodity flow problem with these capacity constraints, uh, is intractable both um, on commercial solvers and, sorry, uh, using GCG as well. Um, but it is ideal for the application of branch and price, which for those of you who don't know, is a branch and bound algorithm with column generation carried out in each node. And the nice thing about this is that it decomposes the problem by train. So the capacity constraints are going to link the link what the different train paths are doing, but each subproblem will simply be a shortest path problem on a direct acyclic graph corresponding to a single train. And of course, they can be solved very efficiently, which is good news for our algorithm. This is the overall setup um, in terms of the flow of the data. So uh, you can see that we start off with data about the infrastructure. Um, the timetable, and of course the traffic data, because we need to know what the initial disturbances were. Um, this then feeds into an, uh, uh, an instance generator, which creates the time space graph. That's read in by skip, which hopefully solves it, gives a solution, uh, and that eventually turns into an updated timetable, which is the key, the key output. Uh, and we can produce various other things from that solution as well. So, but skip is in, in the heart here, it is the solver, and um, we've extended it by using plugins written in C, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm just going to point out three kind of highlights from our implementation in skip. So, the first one um, is a very popular technique uh, in column generation called partial pricing, and the idea here is that you and rather than solving every subproblem in every iteration of the column generation, you simply solve some of the subproblems. So in this case, we have a parameter called num pricing groups. Uh, we found that three uh, is a good uh, fat value to pick. And what that means is that only a third of the subproblems are solved um, in each iteration of the column generation. And the idea behind that is it allows the dual values to converge more quickly relative to the amount of effort you're putting into solving subproblems. Um, you can see from that performance profile that 
uh, there's been a, a modest improvement in the solution times, but an improvement on uh, very many of the instances. So that's good. Um, we also used reduced cost variable fixing to accelerate the, the column generation process. And um, this is perhaps a slightly less well-known uh, idea. And uh, it is that if you, if the reduced cost of an arc in the time space graph for a particular train is greater than the gap that you have uh, during the solve process, then a path containing this arc can't possibly appear in an optimal solution. And so you're safe to remove that arc from the graph. And the idea is that then you don't uh, generate columns which are unlikely to be in a, or which can't be in, a, in an optimal solution and it speeds the process up. Um, we use the Lagrangian bound as our lower bound in the gap calculation. And um, I won't describe all of the things on the left hand side going into the reduced cost, save to say that they're all directly available once you've done the pricing. So as soon as you've done a pricing round, you can get all of those values uh, already computed, uh, add them together, see if it's bigger than the gap. And that makes implementing this uh, very efficient. Um, it's called uh, by an event handler, because of course, although it's efficient, you may, uh, you, you may well only actually remove significant numbers of arcs at, at key points in the solve process. So it's called, first of all, when node two is focused, and then after that, whenever the best, a new best primal solution is found, uh, uh, because that tends to be when the gap um, drops significantly. And you can see again from the performance profile that that's provided uh, a good improvement to the solution times. Finally, I just want to talk about branching. So we implemented um, a custom branching rule and it flows from this proposition, which I've got here. And that is given a fractional uh, LP solution, that is uh, a solution to, to the um, restricted master problem. We can find two variables uh, relating to paths for different trains and a capacity constraint uh, such that the first variable is fractional, the second variable is at least non-zero, the capacity constraint is held at equality and the coefficients are one and either one or delta respectively. Now what that means uh, in the interpretation is that these two trains K0 and K1 are competing for that uh, resource RT. So uh, K0 is trying to occupy that resource and K1 is trying to either occupy or ban it, depending on whether that's a one or a delta. Uh, and that allows us to create this um, rather natural branching rule, where in the left-hand branch, uh, the train K0 um, is prevented from occupying the resource, and on the right-hand branch, uh, train K1 is prevented from either occupying or banning the resource, depending on what that whether that coefficient is one or, or a delta. And I think this is quite nice because when we add it in the delta uh, and the banning into the capacity constraint, it wasn't immediately obvious that this wasn't going to ruin the structure um, of the problem. Uh, and it certainly meant that we couldn't uh, kind of directly apply things like the Ryan Foster branching rule, um, but we've managed to come up with this and it seems to be very effective. So I'll just very briefly um, show you the results. So these are the instances. We created 310 instances, one hour long. We just went through January 2017 and got the real uh, traffic perturbations that happened. Uh, and so they've each got 240 time intervals in total. Uh, the area that we used has 330 routes. And remember that had we used track circuits and modeled them directly, or explicitly, sorry, uh, there would have been many more uh, than that. So that's, that's led to the time space graph being smaller than it would have otherwise been. Uh, and this area includes Doncaster Station, which is in uh, northern England. Uh, and Doncaster Station is a bottleneck. So it lies on a main line, on the East Coast main line. Uh, it also has four local double track lines uh, emanating from it. 
and it's got nine platforms. And if you look at this highlighted route in bold, uh, you'll see that coming into to platform one from, from that line cuts off almost all of the right hand side of the station. And there are quite a lot of examples of routes like that at Doncaster. And that uh, helps to turn this into quite a problematic bottleneck. Some of the um, characteristics of the instances are shown in the plots beneath that. And the main takeaway from those is that uh, the instances represent quite a, uh, a good spread of, of from uh, instances where there were no conflicts whatsoever. And we know from our theoretical results that they're guaranteed to be solved at the root node with no branching. Uh, through two instances that had a lot of disruption and a lot of conflicts between the trains. And we've actually managed to show that um, the branching rule sort of shows theoretically that there's a relationship between the number of conflicts and the difficulty of the instance to solve. And that's confirmed uh, in our empirical results as well, uh, which is nice. So the headline result from our computational tests were that 81% uh, of these instances were solved automatically in 20 seconds. And you can see uh, a slightly more uh, fine-grained representation of the results in the, the plot there, uh, below, below the heading. Uh, and the plot at the bottom is showing the gap after 20 seconds for those instances that weren't solved automatically in just 20 seconds. And you can see that the vast majority of those uh, the gap is very small, uh, most of them significantly below 1%. And that's uh, really because by using a time index formulation, we get a very, very strong uh, formulation and uh, these good solution quality guarantees. Um, and I think the these results show more broadly that um, it is actually realistic to use uh, solve time index models to optimality in a real time environment, uh, which isn't necessarily uh, a given. So that's nice. Um, we've just submitted this paper uh, and you can find the preprint uh, online if you're interested at the URL displayed there. Um, that concludes my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Yes, uh, so thank you very much for the talk. Um, so actually on Slack, there has been a question already by Marco Lübecke who uh, would ask for the instances because of course he wants to try GCG on it. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, I'll get, I can get in touch with him. Good. Uh, for other questions, please use the chat, uh, but I have a question in between. So for the Ryan Foster branching rule, how do you enforce the, the two cases uh, in, in your pricing problem? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it's important uh, with a branch and price uh, implementation to have a, a compatible branching rule where you can enforce the, uh, these branching constraints uh, in the sub-problem without compromising uh, the efficiency of its solution. And in this case, um, let's take, for example, the left-hand branch of in the first uh, instance there, K not cannot occupy RT. Um, that's simply done by uh, preventing, by um, setting the arc weight for any arc within the set ART. Remember, that's the set of arcs. Uh, that's what well, one of them is used in the path if and only if RT is occupied. Uh, you simply set those arc weights to infinity um, and then they definitely won't be used and then that train will definitely not use that resource. And similarly in the banning you just change the arc weights for A bar RT. So I have a, there's a constraint uh, there's a constraint handler in Skip which enforces those constraints, but it's really very simple. It just changes some arc weights. So I didn't quite understand. So you you want to in, in the the second case you want to enforce that uh, the arc is used, right? No, sorry. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, you're right. So that's an alternative uh, that we did look at. You could say um, on the left hand side k naught cannot occupy rt and on the right hand side k naught must occupy rt but that's not what we've done so on the left hand side k naught cannot occupy 
RT, but on the right hand side we're actually saying that the other train that's competing for this resource cannot occupy RT. Ah, I see. Okay. So this breaks the conflict because they know Got it. now both of them can't use it. Yeah. Okay. So can you see the chat? So there are two questions there. One on, on uh, slide 14, what are LB and UB? All right, okay. Um, so they're the upper bound and the lower bound. Um, so uh, in this case, the um, upper bound, because we're minimizing the upper bound is the best primal solution found so far. And the lower bound um, is the Lagrangian bound. So um, that's the, um, I think it's the LP bound minus um, the reduced cost of each subproblem or minus the number of trains times the minimum reduced cost among the subproblems. Okay, then there's another question. So could you please briefly elaborate partial pricing? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't, didn't put very much detail on this slide. So the idea is that rather than solving every subproblem uh, in every iteration of column generation, you just solve a, a, solve a subset. Um, so in this case, uh, your restrictive master problem uh, LP would be solved, uh, return the dual values, and you'd update the, the weights on, on the graph that you need to solve the subproblem on. And then you'd simply solve it for a subset of the trains. So rather than solving, say, 30 shortest path problems on this large graph uh, every time, I just, in this case, I just solve 10 of them, uh, a third. And they, the ones which are solved each time rotate around. Yeah. OK. So there are no more questions now. But uh, as said earlier, you can use the Slack channel uh, to, to ask further questions. Uh, yeah, and so I thank uh, both speakers uh, for this first session, so Edwin and Christopher. And so we will now have a little break until uh, 3.15, 15 minutes break. Uh, ah, there's another question coming up. Maybe you can still answer that. Did you face difficulty in convergence of CG? Um, actually, no, not really. So I, I think we had on average, um, around 80, 80 or 90 uh, columns generated, uh, at the root node. Um, so the L, the LPs, the column generation actually works really, really well. Uh, the sub problems are fast to solve. The convergence is good. The, main problem that we have in the difficult instances is actually in branching. So when there are a lot of conflicts, uh, it struggles to sort out uh, all of the conflicts with the branching. Uh, the uh, question is expanded. How much columns uh, you were generating in each gener iteration? Um, yeah, well, I, I'll, yeah, I, I can't, uh, I'm sorry, I can't give too much, too much <laughs> more detail except, yeah, about 80 to 90 at the root node and then uh, a few more in every, um, in every branch. But, but you're solving the pricing problem and for each pair of, of, of trains or for each train or? So there's one pricing problem per train and when it's yes. solved, it yields one new column. So uh, in the, in the uh, worst case, it can add one column for each train. Uh, it always adds one column for each train. Ah, see, I, I think that this was the question. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, it, it just, just one column per pricing problem. It is, uh, because it's the shortest path problem on a directed acyclic graph, it's pretty quick to solve. Uh, and uh, with the sort of, I think it's Khan's algorithm, kind of standard labeling, labeling algorithm to solve it, it just yields one column. We did look at trying to use um, heuristics to generate multiple columns at once, uh, but to be honest, the, the subproblem gets solved pretty quickly, so it, it's not really worth it. Yeah. Okay, and one final qu a quick question. Is there a path to deployment at National Rail? Um, hopefully, uh, but it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. 
so so sorry uh, i already uh, said uh, thanks to the speakers and uh, we have a 15 minute break now see you then